Hello everybody, today we are going to discuss La Belle Dame Sans Mercy by John Keats and it's a ballad and ballad means a narrative poem, a story poem, story which is written in the form of poem and ballad actually means a, a story which is sung and performed with dance and music that is actually uh, ballad uh, door to door by such kind of uh, say narrator or storyteller so this is a kind of very old format of uh, storytelling and John Keats has written uh, this poem in that format it means it's a as I said it's a ballad and the title La Belle Dame Saints Mercy actually is taken from the poem of same title same name by Alain Chartier so the title was exactly the same and he has adopted the title for this poem and this means the beautiful girl La de Belle Dame so the beautiful girl sense that is without and mercy is mercy kindness benevolence so the beautiful girl without mercy, one who is very cruel, uh, careless, unfeeling. So that is the title and here the, the, in the, at the center of this poem there is that beautiful girl of course who deceives so many uh, knights and princes and king. So that is at the center, that's why the beautiful girl with, uh, without mercy that's the title now <clears throat> apart from all these if we talk of the form uh, and the poetic uh, devices used in this poem so as I said one that this is a ballad moreover this is a poem in uh, 12 stanzas it's written in 12 stanzas and it has a cyclic pattern so uh, how it begins it ends in the same manner with the same situation and same scene and apart, um, <clears throat> to add uh, more I can say that iambic pentameter if we talk of metrical pattern here so sorry not iambic pentameter iambic tetrameter has been used in this poem uh, especially in the first three lines it is iambic tetrameter and the last line it is iambic diameter so that's how the poem goes and the rhyming pattern is A, B, C, B. That is the rhyming pattern here. Um, I should write here A, B, C, B. So that is the rhyme pattern which goes through the whole poem. Uh, very, uh, we can say musical and <clears throat> John Keats was a romantic poet so he has kept that romantic tradition uh, which included fancy imagination uh, supernatural elements as well so all those things have been followed here as well uh, somewhere or the other we can say uh, there is a deviation from the regular metrical pattern in this poem that is somewhere the poet has used an apiste as well so I'll tell you where he is using an apiste or one extra syllable. <coughs> so that has been done. Symbolism means uh, there are uh, symbolic elements or symbols have been used in this poem. So, uh, lily and rose used in the poem are symbolic of deathly atmosphere or suggesting death or something like that. If we talk of uh, apart from that alliteration, assonance, consonants, enjambment, uh, all that have been used, anaphora, so all these things have been used by the poet in this uh, poem and um, so though it's not a very long poem but yes uh, it, uh, it in, has uh, certain themes in built in this poem or uh, it, it conveys uh, or it includes certain themes and the themes are the theme of death the theme of illusion, the theme of reality, which is running through the theme of love. So all these themes are present, we can say, in this poem. So these are uh, some of the special 
things or features or characteristics uh, qualities of this poem now let's see how the poet or what actually the poet is doing so one more important thing that i would uh, like to add here that this poem is suggestive of keats failed love affair with fanny brawny yes fanny Yes, that was the name. So this is also suggestive of his failed love affair with Fanny. Uh, John Keats' financial condition was not good, and he was uh, sick as well. He was suffering from TB. So he uh, he knew that that would not culminate into uh, something good or positive, and so it conveys that. Um, that failed love affair in his poems and letters as well the things uh, about his love to Fanny Brony comes out and here too we can see a suggestion of that so there is obsession as well uh, and infatuation as well so all those things have um, uh, say brought together uh, in this poem to convey that uh, romantic idea of love and so moreover Keats was a uh, poet of love he was a love poet uh, to him love was like uh, he, he as he used to say that uh, beauty uh, i should say rather than love he was a poet of beauty so beauty is truth and truth is beauty that was the principle uh, of john keats he was a worshipper of beauty and here too uh, some hint of that is present in this poem so let's see how he is conveying all these things in a very beautiful manner through this poem. <clears throat> oh, what can ail thee? So what happens actually the scene and the things here are a stranger uh, meets a knight, one who is all alone and roaming here and there. The situation seemed to be quite uh, pathetic and full of anguish and they had a talk and then the knight actually tells him uh, the plight his plight he describes his plight and what he actually underwent so <clears throat> it's not uh, difficult to assume the situation of those times so night roaming about was not a, uh, a rare thing or so so it was actually a poet is telling us or describing the situation of medieval or time or middle ages i should say as we describe poetry in different ages or literature in different ages so he is talking of those times so a knight was roaming around and a stranger met the knight so how he is uh, say describing that situation it's a very beautiful poem let's see oh what can ail thee knight at arms so knight at arms simply a warrior uh, <clears throat> a fighter with arms at hand so that is knight at arms ail that is trouble bother pester so he is asking the stranger who met the knight is asking that what is it that ails you knight what is it that troubles you or what is it that can pester you alone and palely loitering that you are all alone all pale and dull it seems like all uh, we can say uh, dull by pain and problems and anguish and loitering that is roaming around wandering so what is it that ails or what is it that troubles you oh night so he is addressing the night and uh, asking these things the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing so the atmosphere is uh, say wintry atmosphere cold atmosphere so it can be said that uh, winter has set in and so through this atmosphere the poet has tried to uh, create a bleak atmosphere a haunted atmosphere or such kind of we can say try to infuse the poem with some supernatural uh, kind of uh, atmosphere or so or the back try to give a background uh, like that in this way so <clears throat> what this is kind of 
pathetic fallacy as well in which a pathos is uh, wrongly used uh, to uh, dis uh, give a sense of we can say uh, uh, anguish and agony and all such so here uh, the atmosphere that sedge has withered now sedge is a grass like plant so that has withered and wilted and even what birds are not singing so this is a kind of what bleak atmosphere that the poet is trying to create through these images and wants to tell us that it was not at all, it was grimy atmosphere grim atmosphere that's what the idea behind this and he has successfully conveyed that uh, we can say here so this is called when atmosphere is actually uh, carrier of pathos when atmosphere describes or tries to create an uh, an element of uh, sorrow or uh, such emotions actually so that is we can say uh, pathetic pathetic fallacy so he has done this here and again now he is repeating this line oh what can ail thee so this is kind of refrain that he is using here when the whole line is repeated again and again so here the first uh, line of the first stanza is being repeated in the second uh, stanza again he is asking the same thing and uh, to that knight at arms so what is it that troubles you so haggard and so woe be gone that you seem to be all distraught haggard your face is all gaunt uh, all say <clears throat> it seems all untidy and disheveled woe be gone woe is sorrow all um, say root or of course uh, like totally uh, bent with pain so what is it that troubles you what is it that bothers you that's what he uh, asked the knight at arms and the squirrel's granary is full and the harvest is done so he's saying so what is it that can uh, bother you that everything is all fine see harvest is all done uh, the crops the uh, have been reaped and harvested and the squirrel has filled its granary full of uh, the grains it has stored all the grains there in the granary now so what is it that troubles here so you can see uh, the rhythm uh, going or running through in this poem and in the first three as i mentioned earlier is using iambic tetrameter we can uh, divide the whole line in four foot yes four foot are there and in the last line there is only uh, say two foot with two syllables and that is what iambic diameter but in the second stanza last line we have an example of what anapist and anapist means what two unstressed and one stressed syllable so that is called anapist syllable so here and the harvest is done so and the so they are weak unstressed they are weak and then here so this part is strong this again weak and then done so here we can say weak weak and strong so that is the pattern we follow in an apiest so one extra uh syllable is there and that's uh, what uh, we have in an apiece so that's how the poem follows uh, an apiece metric metrical pattern as well somewhere in the so iambic uh, tetrameter has been used and diameter has also been used uh, making it an apiece okay so now i see a lily on thy bro with anguish moist and fever dew 
Now these are the symbols here. Poet is using symbol lily and fading rose. They are actually symbolic of approaching uh, or say death lily atmosphere, death like atmosphere. So just as we uh, <coughs> uh, sh say shower or put uh, the lily flowers on the grave or <coughs> that is uh, actually uh, telling us about how the situation is so deathly and the condition of night is so grim and he is also um, quite uh, in a in a mood of I should say uh, for, uh, anguish and sorrow and anxiety so that is uh, how the poet is uh, trying to create or involve a supernatural element here in this poem so this is telling us about a bit of supernaturalism that how the poet is infusing that supernatural element with the help of this lily and rose and telling us of that uh, uh, quality of the atmosphere the scene he is trying to create that how death like and deathly it was so with anguish moist and fever due so it was he was all feverish he was all full of anguish and agony and on thy cheek a fading rose fast with it too that means that color on your cheeks that rosy hue that rosy color too is what fading and going pale and going dull so that is how you appear the knight who was roaming all about all alone so he seemed all uh, say bothered and very uh, in, a, in a troubled state he appeared so now there is a shift right in the beginning the two stanzas are using second person and after that from the third stanza there is uh, first person and in the third stanza it is the speaker himself and now from the fourth stanza we have the knight who is describing or depicting his condition his plight so he says i met a lady in the meds full beautiful a fairy's child <coughs> her hair was long her foot was light and her eyes were wild so what he is trying to say that in the meadows meds means meadows pastures leaves so i met a lady in the meadow when i was uh, passing through the meadow i i found a lady full beautiful very beautiful extremely beautiful a fairy's child that is like a fairy yes she was that beautiful like a fairy her hair was long had long hair her foot was light sprightly and so quite agile and her eyes were wild so it gives a sense of something uh, abnormal something which is not regular something that is different something of again that supernatural element that the character of this lady is not what uh, it should have been so that thing has been presented or introduced here by the poet so there was a kind of uh, a wild emotion in her eyes and her hair uh, was loose okay, lying loose not braided or so so that was quite unusual so that a sense of unusualness is there in the character of that lady and that is what the poet is trying to convey here and he has succeeded in that we can say i made a garland for her head and bracelets too a fragrant zone so i just decorated her the night i did whatever i could do i made a garland i offered bracelets as well i made bracelet as well and she was like all fragrant 
that it it made whole her whole uh, say character all fragrant it was uh, she was like exuding exuding uh, all good smell all that uh, fragrant smell was uh, fragrance was there uh, coming out of her self so that is uh, she looked at me as she did love and made sweet mourn so she looked as if she had fallen in love with me as she did love as if she was in love with me she was falling in love and mad sweet mourn just sweet murmuring sound as if kind of suggesting that she was in love with the night she had fallen in love with the night so that kind of hint and intimation was there in her voice and i set her on my pacing steed steed is horse so i set her uh, on my pacing steed and nothing else so all day long so we moved about we just wandered and roamed sitting on that horse here and there for side long would she bend and sing a fairy's song so she would while riding she would bend here and there and she would sing a very beautiful song the fairy song so the song was that sweet that beautiful it seemed like a fairy song so all happy they were riding on the horse she was singing and the knight was enjoying and what she found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and mana dew so she brought all this for him what all the sweet things all the sweet roots all the sweet fruits mana dew is the food uh, taken by god so it was like that all so tasty and delicious also sweet so it uh, it uh, he is comparing that to be uh, that with mana dew the the food of god so it's it was so sweet and delicious that and she offered me all that for and sure in language strange she said i love the true and then in a certain full of certainty full of surety she expressed her her love for me she said i love the true so i truly love you so that was the expression of love from her side she frankly just expressed her love for the night and so you can see the metrical uh, you can see the rhythm and rhyme as well here as i mentioned this a b c d rhyme is being followed so you can see arms then loitering then lake and then sing so only a uh, loitering and sing they match and the other two they don't match so this a b c v goes through the whole poem the uh, all the complete poem is in 12 stanzas and then finally at the end we find a cyclic pattern so i'll uh, show you how it is all now uh, here and moreover in this part what we are going through that garland made a garland and she was singing like a fairy uh, it was also sweet and she offered all that so that is uh, the romantic quality that emerges in this poem so the romantic poets actually uh, infuse their poem uh, with uh, an element of fancy and imagination Uh, of course the kind of uh, love thing that would also be there as has been uh, expressed here in this poem so all that uh, element of romanticism has been used in this poem by john keats and that too in a very beautiful manner this poem is really quite loved by uh, all the readers of john keats and she took me to her elfin grot so elfin of elves that is of 
fairies and such kind of the messengers of God. So she took me to where her elfin grot, grotus cave. So she took me where she lived in a cave, in a grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore and she started weeping and sighing and heaving and all that. She started doing that and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. So it didn't mean that uh, really he might have kissed her four times or so but the idea is what he is trying to say that I too express my love to her by kissing her just I uh, she was weeping and crying so I just consoled her at that time when she was sighing uh, and it was like uh, bitterly weeping and all so I shut her eyes consoled her and kissed her and expressed in that way expressed my love to her so this wild wild is an example of repetition and in the whole poem we find several examples of uh, say assonance and consonance so you can easily find it out what is assonance And what is consonance? So alliteration also is there. So assonance is when vowel sound is repeated. Uh, it is quite like I should say um, alliteration. In alliteration what happens consonant sound is repeated or I should say it is quite like consonants. In consonants a consonant sound is repeated in assonance vowel sound is repeated and alliteration in alliteration what happens the consonant sound should be repeated in what uh, uh, in the in a consecutive manner in the same poetic line so that is called alliteration. So here you can find several such examples uh, of all these. So this alone, palely, loitering, it is full of what? Consonants. And this is um, liquid consonant as well. It, liquid consonant, we say L, M, N, these sounds are called liquid consonants. So they have been used here in this poem. So you can find these several such examples here. So now what is saying and there she lulled me asleep as if singing some lullaby or so she lulled me asleep put him to sleep and there I dreamed oh woe betide yes I just saw a dream I was lost in some dream I was uh, I was seeing a dream and there I felt yes woe has befallen me was sorrow sorrow had befallen me I saw I felt that the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hill side so that was the latest dream so he actually at the end he found himself lying on a hillside so he is describing that so there uh, I found myself actually when I was there lying at the hillside this was the dream which I saw this is the latest dream that I had and what was the dream or what was there in the dream he is describing here I saw pale kings and princes too pale warriors death pale were they all so he saw yes princes kings and warriors and they were all pale and dull and in a deathly condition they were all exhausted like that and they cried la bel deem sins mercy thee hath in thrall actually they were all they were all deceived by the same 
beautiful girl and now it was the knight who was deceived by the girl it was his uh, turn and so when they saw the knight they all cried and said now she had taken you also in her thrall uh, and, and she she has uh, captivated you as well she had just uh, tied you in her fascination or just uh, enamored you and captured you uh, she has done that with you as well and she, you you are also now tied in uh, the uh, the strings of her beauty and you were also uh, say enslaved by her you were also bonded by her and finally deceived by her so they actually conveying this to the night that like us as she deceived us as she betrayed us she has done the same with you as well so uh, that's what they are telling him i saw their starred lips and the glow so the poet is trying to uh, tell us what i saw their starred lips in the gloom <clears throat> so what actually it is that uh, starred lips in the gloom so that means he is um, say when he looked at those nights so it was gloom that gloomy dark atmosphere of evening so <clears throat> they appeared to be starving for days their lips were all dry past so it was a sign that they were starving for days with horrid warning kept wide so they in a with a horrid look with a terrible look they were gaping and they were just with dilated eyes their expanded eyes they were looking at me and i awoke and found me here on the cold hills side and watching all this with a stroke or fit of horror the knight got up he just aroused he rose from his he awoke from his dream he rose from his dream and he saw what that he was lying there at the hill side that uh, what what he saw in the dream so that happened with him as well that he was betrayed by that beautiful girl and he was lying there all alone that too on that hill side and this is why i sojourn here so sojourn means stay so that's the reason i stay here because i have been deceived by that lady and uh, had been left alone to wander and saunter here or to roam about here so <clears throat> that's why i alone pay lord dull uh, i'm loitering and just wandering here that is the reason because it's all i i also uh, have been a prey to that beautiful girl who is without mercy like others she betrayed me as well she deceived and dished me as well and so i am uh, wandering all alone here on this hill side though the sage is withered from the lake and the and no birds sing so again that uh, atmosphere that the poet is bringing back uh, here in the last part so that's what i mentioned in the beginning that there is a cyclic pattern in this poem how the poet begin in the same way he is ending and telling us that atmosphere is all gloomy all dark and it is symbolic of uh, the bleakness that the poet is want to suggest or in, include or infuse his poem with so he has done that quite successfully uh, we have discussed about rhyme there is one more thing that i would like to tell you that is enjambment and enjambment is run on lines that is used by several poets so run on lines means they are not stopped by any there is no pause in the line no uh, comma full stop or semicolon or colon the line runs into the other line 
so that is called enjambment so that has also been used and several uh, poses commas have also like knighted turn so it is preceded and succeeded by commas and though it's a grammatical usage but this grammatical usage gives us a hint as well that knight was all alone uh, uh, we can say <coughs> separated or alienated from the other people so that alienation has been suggested uh, very beautifully through the use of commas here so or <coughs> so the other things that you must remember that it's a ballad uh, a failed love affair of kids with fanny brawny suggestive of that element of supernaturalism love deception illusion reality all that has also been included here uh, these are the themes running through the whole poem metrical pattern is iambic tetra tetrameter and uh, iamb iambic diameter so that is the metrical pattern used the rhyme scheme is a b c b which runs through the whole poem cyclic pattern total 12 stanzas have been used so these are the kind of things which the poet is using here in this poem romantic elements can also be mentioned symbolism used in this poem should also be mentioned so i hope this poem is quite clear to you you might have understood everything you if you have any queries you can just uh, ask me by uh, commenting in the comment box comment box i'll definitely respond to your comments and hope you enjoyed it i'll come with more such poems Till then, thank you very much.